So our last speaker for tonight is Sven Hauberg, and he's going to talk about Zcash anonymous cryptocurrency. The subtitle of this talk is Zero Knowledge Succinct Non-Interactive Arguments of Knowledge for Lay People. If there are lay people who could memorize that and can repeat, you get karma points. Sven is a mathematician, a coder, a cryptographer. He also does functional programming in C, which probably makes him the person you might want to listen to. Please, a round of applause for Sven. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, thank you all for coming. Uh, so the short version of the subtitle is uh, ZK Snarks for the Interested Layperson. Um, quick check, has anybody from the audience heard the term ZK Snark before? Oh, that's more than I expected. Uh, okay. Um, so at the end of this talk, hopefully, um, you will uh, know how these things can be used uh, to build a cryptocurrency that, which is kind of like Bitcoin, but has better uh, privacy and anonymity properties. Um, little disclaimer, I won't be able to explain to you how the ZK snarks work. So uh, please don't be too uh, disappointed by that. So that will be another talk for next year, maybe. All right, so let's start right. Um, Zcash is, like I said, it's a cryptocurrency, uh, magic internet money, um, kind of like Bitcoin is in fact based on the Bitcoin code base, so it's kind of like an altcoin uh, that you may know, but uh, other than a lot of other um, coins, it actually adds a substantial um, new feature to the protocol. Um, and that is mainly a new type of transaction that uh, is a capable of shielding uh, the sender, the receiver, and uh, the amount of money being transferred. Um, now this uh, type of transaction lives next to, to the regular uh, Bitcoin type transaction, so you actually have two types of addresses. Uh, one that's called a transparent address, starts with a T, and a new type of address that starts with a Z or Z. Um, uh, which gets used by the new type of transactions. And yes, uh, like I already said, it uses these uh, so-called ZK snarks, which are relatively recent uh, uh, kind of mathematical magic, as I like to say. Uh, I think the earliest, uh, 2010 is the earliest uh, uh, citation from the Zcash spec. Um, yeah. Uh, for a little bit of history, uh, Zcash is, a, is an evolution basically of two academic proposals, one called Zero Coin, which was uh, still pretty different uh, from Zcash, and the other is called Zero Cash, um, and that is already almost uh, like Zcash. Um, uh, so you could consider Zcash a, um, an implementation of Zero Cash with uh, some refinements and improvements. Um, now, uh, the, uh, or a number of the inventors of Zero Cash and a number of other people have formed a company uh, in order to actually um, yeah, get, this, get this system off the ground as its own um, altcoin. And I'm uh, told they are also in the process of forming a nonprofit foundation to govern uh, the future development or something. Um, Little disclaimer, I am not affiliated with any of these entities. Uh, I'm just an interested bystander who happens to uh, think he can explain this stuff a little bit. Uh, so, um, because we don't have so much time, uh, this talk is going to focus entirely on the technical aspect. Um, there are also other interesting questions, but I just want to explain um, how does this system work as in the abstract, um, what do the transactions look like, uh, what exactly is being hidden, what isn't hidden maybe, um, and how can, you, how can you verify even the validity of a transaction if you know almost nothing about it. Um, yeah, and lastly, it'll then become clear where the ZK snarks come in. Mm. So if you know Bitcoin, this is, a, just to recap, this is a Bitcoin transaction. Um, 
Uh, sorry. So imagine Bitcoin. Um, I don't want to go into blockchain or any of that here because we don't need to. Please imagine Bitcoin just as a long list of transactions that is publicly verified. That is entirely um, enough for this talk. Uh, because the Bitcoin uh, system is basically transferred over for the transparent uh, world, um, we can just focus on an individual transaction. Okay? So this is one single Bitcoin transaction of which you have a long list um, in the world. And each such transa transaction takes a number of input amounts from previous transactions and then declares a number of output um, amounts uh, to uh, some uh, receiver addresses. And in order for this uh, transaction to be valid, uh, you need um, most of all, well, these two things, you need to show that you actually have authority to spend the inputs and you need to sh uh, make sure that, well, the input amounts balance with the output amounts, right? Now, um, <clears throat> uh, like I've already alluded to with uh, Zcash, the, uh, the picture looks almost exactly the same, except there's a new block at the end of the transaction that adds some um, things called join splits. And, um, yeah, what these are and how you can um, uh, verify and prove their validity is the main topic. So let's jump right in. Uh, what does a join split uh, a join split look like? So <clears throat> as a as a major difference from Bitcoin, uh, value in these new Zcash transactions is actually transferred in the form of virtual coins. Right? That's kind of ironic because Bitcoin, despite the name, doesn't actually contain any sort of coin concept anywhere. Um, here we have that. Um, and you can see from the picture the, uh, that uh, each join split takes two coins as inputs and it generates two coins as outputs. So the input coins are consumed and no longer valid at the end and two new coins uh, come into existence. So why two? Um, just really quickly, that's because um, that is general enough for anything. If you just want to consume one coin, you set the other to zero. If you just want to produce one, you set the other to zero. And if you want to consume more or create more, you just combine multiple of these joint splits in the same transaction. Okay. Um, and now the important part, each such virtual coin has a, well, what's called a note plain text that is basically a, a tuple of values that uh, contains um, the information about that uh, coin, namely its owner, its value, and some technical, um, technical values that we'll get back to. Mm. And this stuff is, is, uh, is kept secret. It is known by the owner of the coin, but nobody else. The only things that are uh, published, actually, um, in the blockchain, in the, as part of the joint split statement, are these so-called nullifiers on the left here and commitments on the right. Uh, don't worry so much about uh, what those are uh, for the moment, but um, these are just numbers that are uniquely derived from the, uh, from the coin, from the coin plain text. Um, and yeah, the nullifiers are always used to, when spending the coin and the commitments are always used uh, to create the, to bring the coin into existence. Um, so since these numbers are uh, different and they are actually derived in such a way that they cannot be matched to each other, um, you can't immediately trace a transaction, right? Um, and uh, this is called a nullifier simply because it, nullif it is a value that essentially nullifies the, the coin, right? It's, it gets consumed after that, it is no longer a valid coin. And the way this works is really simple. I can explain this on this picture. Uh, each node in the network um, simply keeps a list of all the nullifiers it has ever seen, and it keeps a list of all the commitments it has ever seen. And when a new join split comes in, it simply checks the nullifiers against the list it has already seen, and uh, only if it is nowhere in there, uh, this is a coin that's still valid. So that's really simple. This is double spending protection, uh, very important, obviously, um, but that doesn't require any magic yet. Now, what requires magic is, well, 
checking that I don't pull these numbers out of thin air, that they actually correspond to actual coins and that everything balances out. The values need to balance, I actually need to be the owner of the coins, and so on. And explaining how that works uh, is the rest of the talk. So this is what the joint split looks like in less of a picturesque form, more of a formal form. This is actually from the paper uh, with slight adaptations for readability. Um, uh, you can see there are a number of, uh, number of values. We are not interested in most of them, uh, but you can see the two nullifiers here for the input coins, and you see the commitments for the output coins, and then you see a value called RT. Um, <clears throat> that's a... Uh, that is a, a number that uniquely identifies the set of commitments in existence at that moment. So it establishes the context for the nullifiers, for instance. Um, if you know what a Merkle tree is, this is actually the root of a Merkle hash tree. Uh, if you don't know what a Merkle tree is, uh, don't worry. Uh, simply think of it as a num, uh, a, well, a, like I said, a unique, a number that uniquely identifies the set of coins in existence. Um, and then, lastly, the interesting and most important part, away at the end here, that little pi, is a so-called proof of validity. And that is a, just a simple number that uh, somehow, uh, with some process, uh, is supposed to convince us that this um, transaction is valid and conforms to all the things we, uh, well, we, all the conditions we expect from a valid transactions. A transaction. And uh, to kind of motivate how that could work without going into too much detail right now, imagine if, if I could convince somebody that I simply know the note plain texts for four notes, the two input notes and the two output notes. If I can convince somebody that I have these plain texts and that these two nullifier values do correspond to the two input coins. And these two commitments do correspond to the two output coins and the values balance out and the two input coins actually exist in this uh, Merkle tree here. Then this is, this is, right, this is already intuitively, um, yeah, this, this is convincing of some sort. And that is basically the game plan for us. Mm. And to make that more uh, more precise, will be the uh, yeah will be will be our job. Now, really quickly, uh, the titular zk snarks. Um, uh, it's already been introduced. What it stands for is a zero knowledge succinct non-interactive argument of knowledge. So this is the black this black box lets us do uh, what I just alluded to. Um, perform that proof that we know these note plain texts and that they um, also um, um, satisfy our requirements. And this is the abstract API really simplified of a ZK snark system. Mm. Maybe a little caveat, there are multiple constructions of ZK snarks, not a sim single, uh, single one. But, uh, so we're talking about the, uh, the one that is used in ZK, uh, Zcash. So at first there is a one-time setup procedure. This is, uh, by the way, uh, um, a concept for, uh, of some interest, but we also don't have time for that one. Uh, this was actually done uh, a week prior to the launch of Zcash, this setup procedure, and it's a very interesting story. If you want to uh, read it, uh, there are several people involved in there, and they have written accounts on uh, how it all went. So that's really, uh, that's really interesting, but we have to skip it, unfortunately. And then we have this proof procedure uh, that we give some some inputs, in our case, the note uh, plain texts, and it generates this little pi value that we can put into the verify procedure, um, notably without the input, and uh, if that uh, returns true, we should be convinced that the prover knows this input such that it satisfies the statement that we set the whole thing up for. And that you just put into a uh, Libsnark, it is literally on GitHub, and um, 
and your system works, hopefully. All right. So to make this all concrete, the so-called joint split statement, this is the, uh, the, collection of, uh, the collection of conditions for validity of a transaction. So it is actually, it is basically what I already said. The prover knows four notes um, that satisfy these things. Each note consists of four values, that is the address of the owner, the value of the note, a pseudo random number called rho, another random number called r. These are of technical interest, we'll kind of gloss over that. And these should satisfy uh, the statement that the input notes appear somewhere in the, our Merkle tree of existing notes. The, uh, the nullifiers correspond to the inputs, the, uh, the commitments correspond to the outputs, the values balance, and we also have spend authority for the inputs. And then non-malleability and uniqueness of row are um, more technical. Non-malleability means that this, um, this joint split, this proof is uniquely tied to this particular joint split, and uniqueness of row uh, is similar for the, uh, the pseudo-random number that has to be actually pseudo-random. All right, so, uh, sorry. Let's go back for one second. Um, how do we encode this in a form that the ZK SNARK system can actually make sense of it? So if, any, if there are any programmers in the audience, um, you know how to encode lots of things in so, some sorts of code. Um, and this picture on the next slide should uh, probably look familiar to many. Uh, this is a Boolean uh, logic or, or a circuit diagram of a Boolean circuit. Um, that computes some uh, logical function. Uh, this is just a stupid toy example, of course. That takes some inputs on the left, and then uh, these Boolean values run along these wires, are combined by these uh, gates here, and you get some output value to the right. Um, <clears throat> now, you know, this is, uh, this is enough to do all the things in your computer. So this could be intuitive as a way of encoding things. However, it turns out Booleans are mathematically not that nice because everything immediately collapses to zero or one. So what the ZK Snarks and Zcash actually use is a, an, a variant called an arithmetic circuit, where um, the values along the, the wires are actual uh, full-blown numbers, and the gates perform the um, arithmetic basic operations of addition or multiplication. So this is another uh, toy example uh, as a circuit for well, adding two numbers and squaring them and then uh, multiplying by a third number. And as it turns out, we can use these arithmetic circuits also to represent Boolean operations. This is just this, this is multiplication. And if you consider the inputs restricted simply to the set of values zero or one, uh, the output is also zero or one, and it is one if and only if both inputs are one. So that's, our, uh, that's Boolean and. Here's Boolean not. That's the function one minus x. Uh, that is zero if x is one, and it's one if x is zero. So we can, we can do a lot with these circuits. We can encode all kinds of, well, expressions or functions in them, but what, uh, what we have in our joint split uh, statement are actually conditions, right? Things like this value has to equal that value or the sum of that value or so. Um, <clears throat> so how do we get there? And for that, we need to introduce the concept of satisfiability. Um, so the, again, this arithmetic circuit, um, uh, we call it sa uh, satisfiable if we can find an assignment for the input uh, values here such that the output becomes zero. Why zero? Because that g immediately leads us to satisfiability of equations. So consider maybe um, this equation at the top here. If we want to know whether this is satisfiable by some assignment to x, y, and z, well, do your high school math. Uh, instead of talking about equality, talk uh, about the two sides being equal, talk about the difference between the two sides being zero. So just transform it like this. Build an arithmetic circuit to represent the left side, and then talk about satisfiability of that circuit so that this left-hand side becomes zero, and then you know that these values uh, satisfy that equation. And ZK-SNARKs 
um, not just allow you to prove, well, satisfiability itself, and that is existence of any, um, uh, of any assignment that satisfies it, but it, uh, it allows us to prove knowledge of the, part of the actual assignment, right? So our note plain texts. So this is kind of our game plan. Uh, you can, you can, you probably have a picture now. Our plan is to encode the join split statement that you've seen in uh, formal uh, equations and such, then turn all those into an arithmetic circuit, plug that into our libsnark, and use it to prove knowledge of the nodes such that the circuit is satisfied. Now, if we want to uh, think back, what, uh, what is it actually that we have to encode in the join split? Um, what are the ingredients? I said something about a hash tree. There are these commitments involved, and I mentioned a pseudo-random function. Finally, for the balance, we need regular arithmetic. So the first three of these are actually all instantiated with a uh, hash function that you know, SHA-256. So we basically just need to build an arithmetic circuit for SHA-256, and then the rest is variations of that. SHA-256, if you've ever uh, seen a description of it, uh, contains lots of binary operations or arithmetic on binary numbers. And so the Zcash uh, implementation, or zero cache, actually uh, chooses the route of representing all of the numbers natively as binary. So if you have, say, a 32-bit number, you take 32 wires, each of them carrying only a zero or a one, and only if you need the actual direct representation, let's say for your balance arithmetic, you convert that with an arithmetic circuit that simply computes the value of the binary representation with the regular formula there. And you can also go back uh, with, a, uh, with a little trick that uh, I don't want to get into. So, not, so as not to confuse. And you can also do a thing like, well, bit shifting or other permutations of the bits simply by, well, permuting the wiring in the correct way. So this would be a bit, a bit shift by two, right? You get the, get the values in at the bottom and then, yeah, reroute everything two places to the right. Mm. And so this should already give you a good idea of what to do, right? You just need to look up SHA-256, take all the pieces, transform them all into these, uh, into these arithmetic circuits, um, just combine everything together. And uh, if, when you're done, it looks something like this. Um, so this is from the zero cache paper. Um, they have this wonderful salad in there, which is basically just, you know, boil it all down. So the H here, that's SHA-256. Um, you see that a lot, uh, but actually not that much more. There's this concatenation, right, this, this bar, there are some constants, and there's regular arithmetic numbers. So this, this down here is the, is the balancing, and some values plus some other values have to equal some values. Uh, here's, here's, a, here's a check for overflow that's also easy to represent if you think about it. Uh, here is the uh, condition that the commitments are formed correctly. Here's the, the nullifier being formed correctly. And uh, the only thing that's missing from this picture is the, the, the Merkle tree lookup because that didn't fit on a single line, so they don't have it in the paper. Not too bad. Yeah. But um, that's basically it. So um, I think we have like seven minutes for questions. <laughs> We'll do a short Q&A right now. Uh, please come up to the microphones. Number four. Um, as, assuming that um, there is a bug and, and that someone can uh, I mean, create money out of thin air uh, using this uh, anonymous, um, is there a way that, um, that the community can at some point see that there is much more uh, Z, Z coin than... Than there should be? Yeah. Um, so, 
Not immediately. And this is actually one of the big dangers. Um, uh, so it's a very good question. Uh, one thing that you can see, if you remember uh, the slide uh, with the joint split statement, you can see when, when coins are created and you can see when they are spent. So at any time, uh, the, the system has a picture of how many coins have been created so far and how many coins have already been spent. But it's not, um, that of course doesn't give you exactly what you want. And uh, there has actually been talk uh, about uh, extending the system in the future to include a sort of a regular um, uh, account where, where, they, where, where every node is required to regularly transfer all their money into the transparent world and then at their leisure transfer them back. So it doesn't, wouldn't actually hurt your anonymity, but that's not in there yet. Thank you. Okay. One question from the internet. Is a split in the, of the chain in Zcash possible? Uh, a fork, you mean? Yes. Uh, that sh would work exactly as in Bitcoin. So, yeah, the, the, all, the, um, all the conditions and everything are enforced by the same sort of consensus mechanism as in Bitcoin. And the last one, microphone number eight. Yes. Um, uh, I was wondering if you've um, kind of looked at uh, the funding aspect and the ethical aspect and the algorithm of, uh, of Zcash. And I was wondering what you think about those, because when I looked um, at how they're funded and what the algorithm, uh, how, it, how the algorithm is collecting uh, mm -hmm. money for the developers and for the investors, yeah. I found that in the first four years, 20% of all the coins will go to the developers mm -hmm. and uh, the investors. And after that, it stops. And the total amount that will ever be made of coins, 10% uh, of those will then be yeah. for the developers and the investors. What do you think ethically um, about the choice they make there? Because they are kind of... Um, um algorithmically programming um, the inequality yeah. there. Well, okay. Um, so, I can of course only um, speak from my own uh, interpretation of this, and I will admit I didn't look at it uh, too closely because I was mostly interested in the technical side, but the way I interpret it is that I think they did this, um, um, did, did it this way, that uh, in order to... Um, have an alternative that's better than um, than uh, than a pre-mine. They, I think, they didn't want to do the pre-mining thing that some currencies do, where the where the initial developers just just generate a bunch of coins that then they own, um, and they also have the slow start mining, um, which I couldn't mention. Uh, that m m means that the first time, the first few blocks, I don't know how many. Uh, the the mining reward is is lower and it slowly ramps up and I think um, yeah, they did those things in order to uh, avoid a situation where the developers have a lot of power concentrated in the beginning and I think this founders reward that you mentioned where uh, it is uh, put into the algorithm that for the first four years they get a percentage of all the mined coins is basically to just balance that out to do that in a fashion that's transparent I think that is the intention. Um, apart from that, uh, you said um, uh, about uh, basically algorithmically making this choice. So how do I um, interpret that ethically? I would say, well, it is put by them into the algorithm, but it's still uh, the, the network consensus that confirms it. So there's absolutely not, nothing stopping uh, the, uh, the network to democratically decide we, we want only half the share for the founders or no share at all. And there is actually, there is an, uh, basically an alternative Zcash, I don't know if it took off or not, that, that just simply rips out the founders reward. And there's also another one that simply, um, that replaces it with something else entirely. Uh, so there's a big discussion of, uh, to be had about that and I think it's pretty interesting. But that's basically my interpretation. Thank you. One more question, Mike Seven. Um, yes, you already went into this a little bit, but I wonder um, what alternative uh, zero cash 
solutions you have looked into because for example there exists monero or monero mm -hmm. which is based on a different hashing algorithm i guess but i don't really yeah. know the differences yeah um i i have to admit i am not familiar with monero i know only that monero uses uh, something called ring signatures so there is some some math magic in there as well but i haven't looked at the differences uh, to that i uh, yeah i'm i'm guessing that the privacy guarantees that they can make are less strong than the ones in Zcash, but um, I, yeah, I don't know the details. And this is it for tonight. Please, a round of applause for our last talk.